Hmm? Okay. Good, good. Everybody same class. Management of growth ventures. Growth ventures in Nalanda only or somewhere else? Oh, same class. Who took that class? Oh, Bhaskar was going down. Good, good. So I was uh, going through some of your notes yesterday about you know what you expect and things out of this course. One thing, you know, what we want to do as part of this course is that you know many things will be said, they need to be compiled and they need to be distributed amongst people. I really don't want people just looking at the notes like this in the class. So what we will decide is, we will have two scribes per hour. For every hour of class, there will be two people who will take down notes. The others can listen, think, anyway we will share the slides and everything else. And anyway all these will not come in the question paper. So there is no point taking down notes for exams. So every class will have two people making scribes of notes. They will have all the slides. And then they will make a PPT or a PDF which is more detailed, which will be shared to everybody else. That will also be part of your teaching assessment, term paper and things like that. So you will not only participate in the course, so you will also take down some notes make it available for everybody else. So that will be one of the term papers for each person in the course and this will be done in pairs so that you know you get to think, talk, etc, etc. Is that okay? So today we need 2 plus 2. Who are the first volunteers? Volunteers for today? You and you. So you all are volunteers for the first hour. Who is volunteer for the second hour or you want to decide after the first hour how it looks like? We can decide after the first hour. Okay? So you, you take the oil, we'll share the slides and everything with you. And then you will prepare a more detailed version of things. And uh, share it with me and some of the other coordinators. We'll finalize it and then share it with everybody else. That way we will have all the list of references, you know, we will make this neat and clean, have all the references and everything else. And other people can add on to it later on. This way at the end of the course we will have a real compilation with all of us. We will have two more term papers and I will we'll, come to that. So, every nation, and when I mean nation here, the Indian subcontinent is a vast nation. It is not just, you are aware of, our, of the extension of Indian culture to Cambodia, to everywhere else, and Indian philosophy and religion have been all over the world. So, our objectives which we have discussed yesterday, and today we will again continue, and stop me anytime when you have any questions. Just stop me. Don't think that you are, you know, wasting my time or anything else. Just stop me. Because this course is something we want to do in an interactive fashion. We want to make this course such that you all will engage in some topic of this vast set of topics which you want. And do deeper study of this during the period of this course and come up with ideas. In an academic institution, ideas, discussions, debates, controversies are the most interesting things. And this is where we need to take it in the most open and healthy fashion. So, other than the Indians, first the Arabs, and then the Europeans started recognizing the strength of the Indians, the ancient Indian science and technology. And I will take you through a few quotations which all of you may have seen in the internet. 
about the capabilities of a civilizational culture. This culture, unlike the partitions of today, were integrated in life. You did not separate science from literature. You did not separate literature from philosophy. You did not separate the poetic meters from mathematics. You did not separate architecture from geometry. Everything was integrated. It is not like I had Kharagpur's courses, venture capital, then, then. It is not like that. It was an open system where everything was linked to everything else. And that is essential for us to study, if not for anything, but to imbibe these virtues of self-control, sublime thoughts, universal fa fables, rare inventions, and remarkable conceptions. I have taken on a project and I was telling Professor Das and others that we have done the ancient stories. You know, we all know our stories other than Ramayana, Mahabharata, we know the Jataka tales, we know the Panchatantra, we know all these stories. And these stories tell us something about life. All your life when you go back out of this institute, Whatever little you remember, you will remember stories that the teacher taught you about some conceptions in science and technology. And this storytelling which we know about Jataka tales, we know about Kathasarit Sagar and all that, do we know those stories which were told about science and technology? Do you know how the quadratic equation was explained by Arjuna's Bose killing Karna, the whole sloka is all about that. And we will come to all those as we come to it. And that is what I want, that we revive those foundational cultures and come up, let us see, with a new way of storytelling for science and technology, so that people will remember it forever. You have all read Laplace Transform, but you've never led his life. Have you read the life of any of these mathematicians? That is the problem of our... So, and that is what this course wants to do. So this is what this person has said. Mark Twain, you know, is very famous for giving outrageous quotes. You must have read his quotations before. And this is what he says. The birthplace of human speech. What does he mean by this? We should come back and figure out. Why does he say it is the birthplace place of human speech? Is it true? The mother of history, the grandmother of legend, etc., etc. We all know about Sanskrit. Do we know how Sanskrit evolved? Is it that it was a step function at Pani? We all know Newton's laws of motion. Do we know that Newton's laws of motion evolved for 1400 years? So there is a history of that. And unless you understand the history of that, you won't understand culture, you won't understand anything. So we all know that we are trying to credit ourselves with counting. This is not right. The whole world knew how to count in various ways. So how counting evolve? What is our place? Where did we make some contributions? It's not that we are the people who developed anything, everything in the world. We are part of a world civilization. But we have made contributions. 
And where have we made it? How do we study where have we made it? What is he trying to stay, say here? So when we go back to our cultures, this is a tentative breakup. There is debate on these numbers. But this is a tentative breakup of certain things. There is a gap and a big disputed gap between these two, which is still being researched about what is the connection? Is there any connection? And it is for us to try to figure out what got lost, what remained, what is it that remained? What is it that was rediscovered? On a land which has the same geography, what happened? Most of this portion has got a historical connotation. There is a big debate about history and mythology. And we have to discuss some of those aspects as we go about it. So the first thing is to give you a bird's eye view of few of the most important things that came up in the Indus Valley Civilization. You know the range of the Indus Valley Civilization? What is this? This is a diagram of a wheelbarrow. So if they could develop a wheelbarrow with all its... So they must be having some idea of mechanics even if it is not mathematical mechanics. When I showed this to one of our scientists and explained to them that because of the food they used to eat, said, so looking at this and says, oh my goodness, RCT treatment, so this root canal treatment going on in Indus Valley. And you know, this was a household practice. In the sense that it is not that there were specialists doing this. The question is why were there so many people required to do this? What is, why were their teeth so bad? It must be because of the food. Why was their food in that shape? Because of the technology of grounding stuff with material. So the material used to ground, grind it, was, was used to get mixed with the food. So that is why if we eat one concordian rice, we get mad. You can imagine what was their situation. But look at this contraption. And if this is a contraption that could have been made by them, then this extends to their knowledge of extremely fine drilling technology. And you will see that this extremely fine drilling technology on all sorts of materials has been one of the most significant technological expertise that has gone through generations in India. You see temples with small holes. You see these murtis that you see. Many of them are hollow on the inside. And you can, you know, those guides will take you, will pass a twig through it and show you that what happens, etc. So this drilling technology, this technology will tell you their knowledge of materials, their knowledge of behavioral knowledge of mechanics, some idea they must be having trial maybe. You know what this is about? Their weights and measures were typically the size 2, 4, 8, 16. Where did they get? Where did they evolve into these? Did they know by number system? Then you know you can start jumping that way. 
how did they evolve a weight system like this They had very, very fine scalings. We are all aware of the, their expertise in pottery, their expertise in metallurgy, and their expertise in making these seals, though we don't know their language. The Indus Valley language has not yet been deciphered. And it is worth us, somebody taking up a challenge of finding what is the state of the art today in deciphering Indus Valley Civilization. There's a big debate whether it's Dravidian, here, where it came from, what all does it mean, etc., etc. What are these? Some say these are symbols, some say these are position of stars, some say these are names of clans. We still don't know. Don't know. But we know that they were very, very advanced in making bricks and clay and this sort of burnt bricks was not seen much at least till now there is not much evidence in the Vedic civilization till we cross several hundred years and it is important to see whether there is that continuity loss why was it lost? was it lost? the big question is if they had made bricks of size 1 is to 2 is to 4, what was the dimension system they are using? They did a foot pound yard system. What dimensions? How will we figure out what was their smallest dimension? How will we know what dimensions they used? If they did not use dimensions, then how are these ratios? 3 by 4, 6 by 7. So there must be dimensions. What are those equivalent dimensions? How is a brick 1 is to 2 is to 4? Everybody calls some brick laying, you know, those who are in civil engineering know this as the English bond, the way you make bricks. All sorts of bondings were there. So it is important for us to try and do some research to figure out what was the dimension system being used by them. And what is the scenario of that dimension system today? We also need to figure out their technology for pottery and metallurgy and we'll come to that later. You saw the video yesterday which said that every household had a toilet and there was underground drainage system in almost all of Indus Valley civilization. Their water management system, if you study Dholavira, their drainage system, if you study Mohenjo-daro Harappa underground drainage systems, their filtration systems, even at that point in time. Their, these dug wells that they use, every house had a water mechanism. So, it is important for us to try and rediscover some of these lost gaps, including what was their dimension system. What dimensions they used? What was their directional system? How did they know north-south? How do we know north-south if I leave you in a jungle? How will you know what is north and south? Tell me. We are all IIT scientists. I leave you in a place and I will tell you leave you there for one month, how will you find out what is north, what is south? How? Can you tell somebody a simple mechanism? Sun rises in the? Does it rise perfectly in the east all the time of the year? You think it rises there every time, every day in the year or it moves? 
it moves it moves up to how much angle it moves depends on where you are in the equator where you are located na this is a simple geometry geodesic geometry problem it's a simple geodesic geometry problem leave you in a desert and you will stay there only give some food and water and some paper and pencil how will you figure out most of these people used to do the direction not only by this obliques have been found obliques have been found to mark the sunrise and sunset end points and these people used in the in the east west alignment of the main seats of mohenjodaro there was these setups and these setups had holes to indicate the direction to the n pole star which was the kritika cluster and if you know a little bit of astronomy you will know that these pole stars have been changing at certain points in time so if you see some of these innocuous points of these ring stones you will discover that from this what will you be able to derive their time period because now you you can do a hypothesis based testing if this was the direction of that plates cluster at that point in time now we know what was the whole astronomical situation over time so we will be able to start dating dating does not only come from carbon dating dating comes from multiple resources sources you are able to date things one of them is astronomical positions for those who read texts it is these astronomical positions and correlation with that which will tell you i was born when this star was up on this sky at that point in time there are references to certain eclipses which are enable us to zero in on this or this or this or this so it is important for us to have for scientists engineers humanities people and everybody if we want to study history we need to study science and technology and if we need want to study science and technology if we don't study history then we will have a very skewed view one dimensional view of science and technology when we come down then we have to relive ourselves back in those times of the continent and during 1500 bc onwards the lifestyle what was the lifestyle as you know from history you know we all read our history written by few english people and now there is a fight between indian people and english people and we are nowhere what was the system there what were the four stages of life brahmacharya garastha vanaprastha and sanyas and what are these four aspects of the vedas they are called the mantras where you learn so this is like you are sitting in iit learning all the material mugging up the second is practice so this is related to the second stage of their lives the third what does aranya mean 
what are, have you ever heard what these have you ever seen what what each of these mantras are what the brahmanas tell you to do mambo jumbo we look at it right only when few englishmen will read it and tell us probably we will know what it means you know what the aranyakyas are what is aranya forest so these are like tales of the forest what are the most famous forest tales in our ancient history so this is when is related to the life of vana prastha what is vana prastha going to the forest and when you go to the forest you start after having learned everything that you wanted to learn practiced everything that you wanted to practice got an experience of doing things you really start contemplating you start talking going to the forest living alone and thinking about what inwards and then comes to the fourth phase which was called sanyasa and it is not meant only for taking monks robes it it means many other things which we can discuss once you understand the language used at that point in time then the meaning of sanyasa has got many meanings you know what nyasa means you can explain to them what nyasa means trust hmm trust placing placing of your whatever it is basically placing of your consciousness and sanyasa means sat nyasa placing your consciousness in truth that is why a sanyasin is one who lives all that time placing their consciousness in truth and there is a technique for doing that in yoga we'll come to that and then there are these smaller vedas and the vedanganas of which one you know very well the other you may have heard have you heard the dhanur veda have you seen the text of the dhanur veda you know how many such upavedas are there no these are the four vedas how many upavedas are there many so another part of your some of you may look at is figuring out how many are there what are they what do they say where is the reference text and we used to talk about these six philosophies which were part of their system now in modern times much, much of them have evolved but the first was gautama rishi's logic and realism which is called nyaya darshan this was the vaisheshika darshan which was the nature of existence of kanada who is credited to have said many verses which talk about the atomistic entity the atomistic entity that is why it is in his name the atom through history is called a a kana that is why kanada the man who pronounced kana then comes to the nature of separation so they were all concerned primarily with not just the material part but the complete part so that is why if you read the samkhya philosophy you will see he talks about the separation of the witness and the nature that every one of us has got a witness who watches everything that we do and has got a nature which acts 
and he explains this whole philosophy of what are the components of this nature, what are the components of this witness, how do you get there? Then Vyasa and his four students, especially Jaimini, explained how these Vaisi Sekha and all this, how action and material are the, are the scientific methods of that time. It is very difficult for us to decipher those back because we have lost much of the language and the culture, but some of it we can still recover. And the two of those components which this Indian subcontinent has saved through ages because they are the part of the core knowledge for which the world says are the biggest contributions of this nation or this civilization is Vedanta and Yoga. And during those times, what we call Jainism, Buddhism, etc., etc., were all integrated part of what was there then. If you go 20 kilometers from here, you will see a site called Moghalmari. Have you heard of this site called Moghalmari? Which is a Buddhist site. Have you gone there? You should go. Just here. Bengal was dotted with Buddhist sites. Some of the greatest Buddhist philosophers came from this region. Have you heard of any of their names? Any one name who came from this region? Have you heard of Atish Dipankara? Sir, he must have done a lot for Buddhist philosophy, Atish. Very rich, sir. Huh? Very rich, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there was. Have you heard of Milarepa? You should read the life of Milarepa. And then look at his lineage. How texts were taken from India translated into Buddhist text and practice. The whole of Rishabdev to Mahavir, the 24th Thankaras of Jainism, which overlapped during that time, and how they evolved mathematics from those times, from 600 BC, the mathematics that was evolved by the Jains, including the Fibonacci theorem, which we call the Fibonacci theorem. And obviously the tantras and the great stories that we write. The most important thing at that point in time was all life was integrated. And there was always a connect between yourself and the universe. Everything was related to that, the study of that. So they studied geometry, why? Because they had to make these ritual altars. So they had to make one square altar, they had to make a circular altar, and they had to make a semicircular altar. It was said that you have to make these three and the criteria enunciated was that they have to be of the same area. So if they have to be of the same area, then you have to know how to circle a square. Then you have to know how to circle a square. Do you know how to circle a square? I'll give you a square of area A or x by x square. Can you make a circle of the same area, x squared? You will write pi r squared equal to x squared. So you will say x equal to a by root pi. How, how did they do it? So 
if you go through step by step of this whole philosophy it is for realizing myself and the universe and my relationship with the universe which integrated them with religion philosophy etc etc that was the way they lived this is the way we live today 5000 years later on people will think that these were all idiots who lived with all these ancient philosophies sitting down there what integration they used to do this is all bogus today we have this methodology that methodology we know how to read the mind by looking at it by a camera what is the use of doing anything else so 5000 years later on everything else will change so it is important to imagine that science and technology have evolved so rapidly that if we look 5000 years from now and if we look back 5000 years from today and if you see the relative intelligence they had then and the relative intelligence we are going to have for the future we may actually be a little thinking about how good we are today compared to how good they were then at those times so let me go through how much time have i crossed i getting tired bored sleepy you want to shake yourselves up a little what does this statement in 8000 bc when they wanted to make these altars and rituals altars of rectangular sizes and wanted to know if this is the rectangular size what is the area what is the area what i do so there is a whole text called the sulva sutras which was written around 200 to 800 bc i think so, 300 to 800 bc anyway times 3000 bc we don't even know what it means then anyway carbon dating can be 100 years 200 years up and down nobody knows so this is the sloka which says a rope stretched along the length of the dial produces an area which vertical and horizontal sides make together this is attributed to this is attributed to pythagoras pythagoras never said i did i developed this theorem somebody else said and if you say that indians were the first to do it again there is a, another scientific jingoism going on because when the egyptians built the pyramids they had a sense of this we stated it but we did not there is no text till now available of the proof we still have to search the first available proof comes from the chinese so science and study of history of science and technology is not to usurp the credit but to place it in proper perspective about how and that will help us understand why we need to publish why we need to tell everybody why science and technology is all about communicating what you do and get input from others that is how it evolves so squaring a circle finding the square root of 2 all those methods were evolved during those times and they were all written in what was the language in 800 bc by which they were able to write poetry sing feelings and mathematics can you write one poetry on newton's laws equation we cannot write because we don't even try it you try it you get used to it you start thinking about it you will be able to write it and once you start writing it then you will try to find out what is the best language to write it and therefore then it requires a language which is 
scientifically created. And then you will start appreciating why the language was like that. Then you will start finding out how it evolved. This is the need for study of history. It places us in this huge gamut of things that has evolved in this world and gives us a meaning and tell us, tells us what Newton used to say in front of the ocean collecting a few pebbles. So the whole of Sulva Sutras is filled with this and I'm just showing you this example to excite you. So that is why I say that the language, the language which was used at that time and which in the 4th century BC, 400 BC around, 300 to 400 BC, was converted in a scientific manner in such a way that even today we are studying computational linguistics of Sanskrit and have not been able to fully convert it into a recognition algorithm, even though we know all the rules. So this whole language which can express anything, we have to understand what is the beauty of this language, what is the limitation of this language. There is a limitation of this language which today when you try to write down all these diagrams, whether you are doing it in biology, you are trying to find out the path, you are trying to do something, writing down a big equation in chemistry or something else, you can figure out where is the problem? Where? Then only we will know, instead of basking in the glory of this great author, we will know how to augment that language. Our problem is living in a glorious past without the attempt to realize what it meant and to take it forward. That is most important. If we don't do that, then we will be just stuck. This whole mechanism, can you tell me what, what is peculiar about this compared to any other language that you know? How do you... It's all the way you pronounce in the mouth the voice that comes out and ch, ch, the tongue that is the so the linkage with mouth with word with breath with mind was integrated in this and if you try to go through the details of why and how it was done, then we will discover that these about how he explained it with an example of how it was done, how he explained that equation by a story of Karna killing Arjuna. And if you remember those stories, you remember everything. You know, we remember board mass. We don't know anything else, we know board mass. We follow board mass, we know the rule. You don't remember the rule, right? You just remember something. This is a manuscript of the Lilavati. You imagine, for us who type anything, erase anything, write some rubbish, they had to write it on something, if they made a mistake, they will write it all over again. It takes so much effort for us to even one man like this by hand, you will write three cards, scratch, garabar ho gaya, this, that. The head, hand coordination is gone. We don't think and write. We write and look. 
and then try to see whether it makes any sense or not. This is such an important trait, the head-hand head, head coordination. If you spend some time writing, if you think for some time and then write, then you will see how much different it is. But we have lost the art, we just write, even programs, you know, you have to write a program, you don't even think anything, you start writing stdio.h, and then you think. In 1400, there is a reference to, yesterday's video also showed, I thought, there is reference into a sloka, which is talked about by Sayan Rishi, who refers to a Rig Veda slok, glorifying the sun, saying that you traverse so many yojanas in half a nimesha. And if you do some rough calculations, people say that he's, he reached this as the speed of light. Question is, how? So this is what is with us. It's what examining whether this law came much later. At least this man in 1400 has made this statement. Even if we don't want to look at 1500 BC. Then was this Kerala school. This Kerala school of mathematicians, which is now coming up today. Especially, she was saying the name of Madhava. In 1350 to 1425, he has written all of this. The whole of the Sun series cos 10 pi, the series pi. And he gave pi accurate to 11 decimal places. And if you use the normal series 1 minus 1 by 3 plus 1 by 5 minus 1 by 7, and if you want to get it accurate to 11 decimal places, you have to take this series to more than a million numbers. He didn't have a computer then. So he must have found out, and people have now discovered, that he had found out a fast convergence series. And based on that fast convergence series, he has found pi accurate to even decimal places. It is worth going through it is worth going through how Bhaskaracharya, how Madhava wrote mathematics in metered poetry. Metered poetry. You try one, you try to write b square minus 4ac by 2a square root, you try to write one poetry around it. Try to conjure up an example. Mathematics, this about 300 years before. See, so today, slowly, slowly, people are saying it is the Madhava Gregory series, etc., etc. Now, there is a big debate about whether they really discovered the foundations of calculus or not. Because they got to the infinite series, they got to convergence. So, did they really, where, up to where did they go in calculus? Because much of our manuscripts are uncoded. We have only got about 5% decoded. We don't have people who even know Sanskrit are interested to even understand. And then you need to know mathematics with Sanskrit. And then you need to know how mathematics was converted to poetry. So how was mathematics converted to poetry? So there was this three systems by which numbers were mapped to words. 
One is the Arya Bhatia system. Arya Bhatia system of numbers mapped to words. Are you getting tired? Okay. Tell me. The second is called the Bhuta Samkhya system. Bhuta Samkhya is Eka Chandra, Do, No, Do Paksha, Teen Netra. For us, Netra is never two. Netra is three. In Bengali, I used to read in my childhood, Ake Chandra, Duye Pakha, Teen Netra, Chari Ved. Pancha Indriya, Chai Ritu, Shapta Rishi, Ashta Boshu, Navagraha, Dashavatar. This is how, so now, among these, I will just explain to you the famous Katapayadi system of the Kerala school. They mapped one to kata paya, two to kata fara, etc. And then added some words with them. So the starting letter with some criteria were the mapping. And here is one example. Can somebody help me read this? Gopi Bhagya Madhuvrata Khala Jivita Khatava Khala Jivita Khatava Galahala Rasa which means this see I am teaching you all this I also don't know Sanskrit that is the state of affairs we are in anyway how does it matter there's a, anywhere you can start, isn't it? You don't know anything, I don't know anything, fine. What does it matter? We'll start. <laughs> At least we are not ashamed. We are not ashamed that others will tell we are fools. We know we are fools, so it's not a problem. Now if you take ga, what was ga? You will get pi to 31 decimal places. All you have to remember is that poem. And they wrote hundreds of those poems. And many of them wrote one poem in the beginning, Om Namo something. And at the end, another Om Namo something. Those when converted in Katapayada indicated when they started writing the treatise and when they ended writing the treatise. So you get the dates. Encoding, cryptography, compression. Rings a bell somewhere. Then these algorithms, Kotaka method, Bhavana method, Chakravala method. We should know what these algorithms are. How were they written in Sanskrit? What is now written as an algorithm, flowchart? How do I code it? And they generally used an integral number system. So is there anything which can still take out from those stuff and, and produce as a lost stuff? So this whole Chakravala method, you know, this, this is Fermat used to tell all his friends to solve this problem. Very interestingly, the solution to this, these two problems were given by Bhaskaracharya in his Leelavad. Who read what? Maybe the same guy, right? Fermat must have been Bhaskaracharya, no. <laughs> Our chemical sciences, initially it was the early Ayurveda, then it was the whole of alchemy, mercury to gold. Mercury to silver, medical tinctures which had mercury. Mercury was that time's major. Have you seen the Victoria Memorial Hall in uh, this one? Have you seen a 
Puri on top of that Victoria Memorial Hall. Do you know that that used to be a, that used to turn around with the wind? So that used to turn around with the wind, it doesn't anymore. So then they started figuring out why. How could such a heavy stone stuff be floating on what? They later found that it, it used to float on mercury. It was loaded with mercury and it used to float on mercury. Mercury dried out, money dried out, interest dried out. So it is now stuck like this. We don't even know a new technology to make it rotate. We don't even have that interest. So all these things, metallurgy, iron, silver, gold, dyeing, tanning, all these were there. And it is important for us to relive and find out. Am I okay on time still? What is 11.20. What is this picture? This is the picture. So we all know when Porus and Alexander's war you heard, no? Or that also you don't remember. So when, what did Alexander ask Porus? When he lost? You don't remember? How would you like to be treated? You are my prisoner. How would you like to be treated? And the story goes on, you know, we Indians have nice ways to write stories, whether it's true or not, we don't know. But what did Porus reply? Like one king treats another. But what did Porus give Alexander as his most prized gift? Two things. Who are those two things that Alexander took back, which is not gold, not silver, not nothing? One ancient Indian sage, he took back. He was a naked, half-naked fakir. There's a lot of stories about him. Find out his name, I will not tell you. And he was taken there. And he was there with Alexander during his trip. Because Alexander died while going back. And the second thing was steel, swords of, made of steel. India's technology of steel making and sword steel making, which is now called Damascus steel, was very famous. So he gave him 30 pounds of such steel. That was more precious than the gold and silver which Alexander got anywhere. Because of? Medical sciences, you must have heard. What was Susutta famous for? Surgical instruments. Why did he make? He was most famous for what? Plastic surgery. Na? Why did? Why did the? You know, what is the story around plastic surgery? What is the story around plastic surgery? Why did it evolve among other things? There must be these juicy stories, right? Otherwise, we won't remember anything. So he was the physician and the surgeon of the ruler at that time. So the ruler used to give punishment. What type of punishment was there during that time? Nakkaddo, kan kaddo, ungli kaddo. Nice, nice forms of punishment we had during that time. Na? And then after seven days, the king found out that that fellow had given wrong evidence, so I gave wrong judgment. So what did the king tell the physician? Kaan laga do? Uska na kaat ki isko laga do. Stories apart, it was refixing of cut elements helping in fix it in the case of people who had leprosy and things like that that Shushtut came up with this rejoining other than his famous principles of surgery 
He has listed 1,120 such diseases and procedures. What is Jivaka famous for? He was whose physician? Jivaka was a great philosopher also, but he was physician somebody who was even greater. Jivaka was Buddha's physician. He was Bimbisara's physician and he was Buddha's physician. You will see in the life of Buddha, Jivaka's name is there. And Charaka was famous for? His name is associated, though there were so many people who did many things, like Atreya, but Charaka is famous for Ayurveda. He was famous for his treatise called the Charak Samhita which is the Ayurveda. So Charaka wrote this Charak Samhita, which is, he was one of the principal contributors of Ayurveda, which evolved for a long time. And this Ayurveda itself, again, I just put this slide for you, which I took from some place in the net. This Ayurveda, again you will see, the whole philosophy is based on that microcosmos and macrocosmos philosophy not just the material part of it. And today when we were discussing, there is this whole new subject which people are trying to look at, combining Ayurveda and genomics. How does Ayurveda relate to genomics? How do you produce, because Ayurveda has become such, it is no longer standardized. So every homemade Ayurveda may not be standardized in terms of so people are trying to evolve standard procedures and mechanisms. We have not collected all the scripts of Ayurveda yet, though some of it is still available. So this is surgery. These are all his instruments. You can find out during those times. Now if he could have made these instruments, which are going to cut human limbs, material science, mechanics, all toolings. There must have been background. You cannot make an instrument out of thin air, right? Just look at your spectacles. How many technologies are required to do that? We take it as assume it as nothing. Then the whole of Kautilya's Arthashastra, economics, this, that. This treatise, which was written by a series of people, of which Kautilya, who is also, though there are many such, but the most famous Kautilya's name is Acharya. His actual name was what? His hidden name was Chanakya, but his actual name was Acharya Vishnugupta. Acharya Vishnugupta. He was from which place? Takshila. And in, his, in Takshila, when did he move out of Takshila? After the Porus Alexander War. You know that history there? No. Read history. At least if you don't get a job, you can teach history. And you can teach history of science and technology. At least, can you do a job? And if you are fancy enough, na, nowadays if you teach all these things in a fancy way, all Google and all will call you. Right? He's teaching history of science and technology. He's giving us lateral thinking. So you have you have many ways to make a life for yourselves. The whole of aesthetics was also a science. The whole of Bharatanatyam and the Natya Shastra, the grammar of dance, the, the meters, this is all about rasa, dhvani, alankar, this whole thing about, just see this person's facial expression, you see these mudras, this whole thing about, you talk to a proficient player of sitar, or a dancer, you ask him that when you play, 
You think how are you going to move? That tabla moves, you move. How do you move? Do they think at a okay, then I do they think and do? Do you think they have practiced and come all the time? You, we all in the Netaji Mitha, a Ghanta program, Kelly, three minor time, time practice, you all do. It is all inbuilt in a philosophy and grammar that enables you to ensure that your mind and hand work in seconds. We, I asked one dancer that when you are dancing in full rhythm, are, are you thinking what I will do next? Tell me what she told me. And then you will get an idea of what our Samkhya philosophy is. She says that when I am in full flow, I am watching myself dancing. He says, when I'm in full flow, my mind just knows what to do. My whole body and every mind, body, mind knows what to do. I, who is beyond all that, am watching and savoring what I am doing. That was the philosophy around which all sciences were developed. This is our motto. Eventually, at the end of all this, the lasting legacy that which unites all our science, arts, and everything else is probably, in my opinion, yoga. It unifies everything from science to philosophy. And it has these, these three steps are the fundamental three steps in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. He says tapasya means practice, swadhyay means contemplation, what you have done, what is it about. And finally when you discover something, Truth and truth alone is what you have to surrender to. And then we have numerous forms of yoga nowadays, you know, you'll see PPC yoga, uh, Priyadarshi yoga, everybody is supposed to be yoga in their name. So there are these three fundamental techniques of yoga. One is called the Hatha yoga, it has got a lot of other meanings. So it is perfecting the body, mind, heart and spirit, these three. Then is the life force, pranayama and then is the laya. So these form the eight, you have heard of this Ashtanga Yoga. So this is all it is about, gives you your union of yourself with universal consciousness. This concept of the ability of a human being in a human life to connect with everybody else has been, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many people, probably the greatest contribution ever in science. So I'll now take you through, do we have time or you don't? What is this, the big controversy? So let us take it as a challenge to figure out what is known till now. Anybody who lives there in Madras? Nobody? Should have gone and, we could have gone and found out what is here. So please, we should find out what is it, what is there. Rama and Mahabharat, epic, real, mythology, fiction, how do we date it?
Have you been, anybody been here? The Gupta Godavari cave in Chitrakut? There is a small slit. And person like me cannot go like this, obviously. Like this, like this, like this, like this, I entered. And in that cave, huge cave, you will see these portions. You can make out these have been cut to make the cave. There is aeration. See, these are all cut in steps. Can you see? Legend says, who is said to have lived here? Ram Lakshman Sita. This, this is what mythology says. There is an attached toilet, bath, everything else. There is aeration. The only thing that I could not figure out is if they cut There is only one slit for which I can enter this way. How did they take the stone out? We have all heard of this non-rusting iron pillar. Do we know how it was made? I was asking our metallurgists, I have asked some of our people to explain how it was made. It's not... We now know reasonably well how it was made. And, uh, you know, it is a good exercise. Anybody from metallurgy here? We can find out, you know, try to recreate that. Let's see if we can make it again. What is this? The Kailasa temple of Elora. So you have a mountain. And you are cutting the mountain from top. How are you going to first design it? How are you going to cut it? How much stone you have to take out? It was made in 18 years, they say. And the amount of stone that you have to take out per day comes out to be so large. It is in perfect north-south direction. Perfect. From top you can see an X as if from a helicopter or an aeroplane you can see it existing there. What, what rock cutting technology, what architectural principles, what foundational concepts were there. Even today if I give you a piece of stone can you make a face also? But this was available. It is not the sophisticated uh, great artists who get crores of rupees making one image. This was ordinary people. Even today if you go to Odisha, you will find simple ordinary people making wonderful murtis. How? How does that conception come? How do you know how much you have to cut there so that the steps will be made? If you go through the details of the Kailasa temple construction and you see there must have been stone cutting machinery. Like today we have construction machinery, you know, all these construction, cement, concrete, etc. So there must have been tools. It cannot be made by Chaini Hathori. Who has been to the Dilwara temple? This is one example of the Dilwara temple. This is made of a single piece of stone. Now you imagine that you are carving this out of a piece of stone. How did you proceed with the carving? You try one day to do any one thing on clay or anything. Just try once. Imagine 1400 people were working. It is not one person. That was the expertise in society. What tools they must have used? Do we know? Can we find out? This is the map of the city of Varanasi. So, you know, we make these smart cities. 
So in Varanasi, it was found by Rana P. B. Singh and others that there are these 12 Aditya temples, sun god temples. And there, is, there, are, there are 14 actually. So there are two in the center and 12 on the circumference. And if you shoot arrows, then this arrow is the 14th July sunrise. This arrow is the 21st June sunrise. So all the Purnima sunrises are done. Many of these are lost, but this is the conception by which they had made it then. You must have been to Konarak at least. Anna? Sun temple, you must have put your finger here. Huh? How many of you have done this? Good, I see he has gone to all the places. Dilwara temple, sun temple. So this is a sundial. There are 24 such wheels of which two are sundials. What are the other 22? Secondly, this is not a 12 hour clock. Now you will see that here there are beads. Many are broken, many are there. The number of beads is fixed. Calculated, designed that way, it is not general design. Then you will see these carvings which indicate what you do at what time of the day. And there are many other unique features of this sun temple at Konarak. It is worth going and trying to figure out how and why it was designed this way. This, have you been to the Halebegu temple, Haisalipara temple? What does this look like? This is not cut by hand. So this huge pillar was cut by a stone cutting lathe machine. It is very clear. I have even more detailed pictures. If you see all these grooves, you can make out that it is cut by something which is moving circularly. So what was that contraption? This, like we have cement, steel and all this today, what was that technology then? We see all our temples like this. This whole geometry. Have any of you seen a fractal image? Image of a fractal? You know, you draw. I take this, start with this, and every length like this, I break it up like this recursively. So this becomes this becomes and so on and so forth. And I add probability to the angles and probability to the heights. I will show you most of nature's trees look like this. I will show you how most of nature's coastlines look like this. And then we will see how most of these intricate designs could not have been done minutely this way. It was done by a grand recursive plan. And this recursion is inherent in our system. What is there in the universe is there in each one of us is there in you know this whole concept of recursive thought was there in our architecture. It's very very world worth studying properly. Look at these temple architectures. What is that mathematics behind this? And Professor Anuradha Chaudhary will want me to tell her, tell a story which I have told her before. 
about how once we were not able to solve a problem of designing a temple dome. So I got all our architect guys, Professor Joyce and I gone. Then we got what are called the young Sompuras. So that Sompura came, he couldn't do this. It was an interesting recursive dome. Because computer scientist, for me, recursion is the, at the heart of everything. So I just love that topic. So then he finally said, Babuji ko bulana prega. So I said, Babuji, his father, 80 years old. So I said, Bula, he says, the Babuji to have to ke mandir mein betha rehte hai, upar wale ke. He doesn't do anything. So I went and heart paw pakar ke Babuji, upar wala ka hi mandir hai, hum log sab nakab ho gaye. So he came. Then he looked at the dome and he looked at the drawing. And he said, Ek danda leo, ek rassi leo, ek kila leo. And below the drawing, he sat down for one hour, 80 year old man, and with his own hands and telling his son, he drew the full thing on the ground. So we have to understand. Two, three things. One is conception is beyond mathematics. There is something more to a human being's conception and capabilities of doing things. This ancient art is lost. It's all there. We have all the modern tools to learn new things. And that is why we wanted to do this course. We wanted to have a set of people like you with whom we will work to set the foundations of learning this subject in the right way. We will not bother too much about people getting angry with us or happy with us. It's not none of them. It's about our ability to take baby steps for our own good. You've heard of Manjul? Professor Manjul Bhargav? The only field medal winner of Indian origin. Not India. We now, you know, taking pride, we take Indian origin, South in Asian origin, American, Indian, African origin. Are kuch apne to karo. This list will be larger. I have crowdsourced this material. Any questions? Was it interesting? So this course, we really want all of you, we will, other than this scribing, you wrote anything or you are only looking at me? Huh? <laughs> The second hour is yours. <laughs> we forgot to assign the second hour. So when you forget to assign the second hour, it is yours. He, they will give you a recording. Or anybody who wants to take, you will get a recording. You have raised your hand or you are scratching your head? <laughs> anybody wants to take up now? Mid sum ka time just scribe hai, uska problem hoga. You will take it up. Full thing no, too much. Okay, thank you. So both of you, oh you want to join? Yeah. Okay, all three together will do whatever you want. There are lots of open avenues. And you know we'll do easy things. We'll write term papers on lives of scientists. We'll write time papers on some contributions. We'll write some papers which link past to present. Like this recursion in temple. Ayurveda and genomics. 
So we'll, and then we'll let you choose what to do. So they'll tell you how we are going to develop this course. But if you have any questions, and if we have any time, normally you should take up all the time. So I'll tell you that story later on. I'll tell you what is there in our, I heard the question of, I'll tell you what is the, the other side of the story. I'll tell you the other side of the story. There is, there is the other interesting side of the story where earlier human beings were born that way. By eggs coming out and saving the eggs and fertilizing it outside. And then how the human beings started getting born within a woman. That came later. So there is that another mythological story for all that. Stories are galore. I can tell you hundreds of stories. Sir. Thank you, sir. It was so engaging and so learning. Um, there is a convention um, of a modern historian here in Kolkata. His name is, the first name I don't know, his surname is Sarkar. And he's trying to rewrite the history of the world or at least India by saying that we should go to the roots of Buddhism. This is very important, sir, because even the evolution of Buddhism, you know, even prior to Gautama Buddha, the philosophy that it came up and the way it evolved, Buddhism, the Vedic and Jainism. These are the three philosophies that came up and along with it came science, technology. So the whole of Buddhism, there are two parts, two interesting parts to Buddhism. There is some Buddhism, though we claim a lot of it came from India in terms of philosophy, some of it, some of Buddhism was interestingly brought from China by Vashisht, the tantric part. So that time it was all mixed. Who were Buddha's main Maudgalya? Maudgalya was Maudgalya Rishi, Kashyapa was Kashyap Muni. So they were all integrated. We did not call it, Buddha did not call it Buddhism. Our Guru Nanak did not call it Sikhism. Down the line when Granth Sahib was written, the Sikh Khalsa was formed, they said he is my founder. So it's all sir, integrated and it is for us to find out this integration link. It is, it is that integrated connect that we want to find out rather than categorize as we want to separate out and find out the innate philosophy. And we will see that there are places where there is difference of opinion and we'll, we'll see where there is unity of that. So Buddhism has been a foundational principle in India. Buddhism went out of India for certain reasons. And you know, when we get time, I will explain to you how and when Buddhism went out of India. The whole Milarepa's Tilopa, Naropa, um, Marpa and Milarepa, actually Tilopa is probably the same person as Gaudapad. Each of them have two names. Because that time it was not considered Buddhism and Hinduism. They just had, because they used to go to Tibet and China, they had a Tibetan and Chinese name as well as an Indian name. Similarly, Atish had two names. Tilopa had two names. Milarepa had two names. Marpa, who used to write all these and go there, had two names. Even today I know 
there are people who have two names. Padma Sambhava has got two names. In the saint's world, he has a Hindu name as well as a... So, it was so linked. We have actually started this separation. This separation was an integrated part of what it was. And there are reasons why Buddhism was beaten out of this country, which was not right. No, no, sir. There are one of them was the other was not that. If you see, huh? See, all these are our uh, history has got history will tell you something that is completely different. You go and see how a people live in the villages where they are belonging to different religions, how their cultures interact. You will see why, why the Yazidis, the Yazidis, their staff flag is a peacock. Peacock is never found in that area. Why? All these stories I will tell. Thank you very much. We are out of time.